So, about a year ago, February 2023, I step outside my apartment building in Berlin and crunch snow underneath. In the pitch dark, I find one of those rental scooters. And I shiver like crazy as I make my way to the train station, which takes me to an airport where I get on a flight. And then, 12 hours later, I step off the plane onto hot tarmac and breathe in this thick tropical air. I had landed in Honduras, smack bang in the middle of Central America. The next morning, I'm on a minibus and we're driving six hours west. Our destination, the small town of Copan Ruinas, right in the top left corner of Honduras. And I was traveling there to attend Let's Talk Coffee, an annual gathering of forward-thinking coffee farmers, roasters, and other coffee professionals from across the world, organized by Sustainable Harvest. They are the sponsor of this episode and a leading importer of organic fair trade specialty coffee. At a conference center, just a stone's throw away from some spectacular Mayan ruins, I found myself transfixed watching presentations from leading thinkers in the regenerative organic coffee movement. Every lunchtime, we'd walk outside and pass a pair of rescued macaques with beautiful red glistening feathers. And while digging into delicious local food like baked fish and sour orange, I spoke with farmers from across the region and was brought up to speed with what was happening in their coffee farming world. And at Let's Talk Coffee, I was asked to moderate a panel on something that I knew almost nothing about. Organic coffee farming. Now look, almost my entire life, I have lived in cities. And when I think about where my food comes from, well, I might be on a train going from one city to another. I look out the window and I would see fields of wheat, fields of potatoes, fields of hay. And my conception of how farming works is, well, you have some land. You put plants in the soil, you feed them fertilizer, nutrition, you make sure they get enough water, you spray them with pesticides to stop the insects eating them, and when it comes to harvest, you collect the crops and you do it all over again. But then, I end up on this panel at Let's Talk Coffee, and I meet one person in particular who just flips my understanding of how agriculture works. A full 180. I'm Lalo Perez. Lalo runs a consultancy called Biophilia. And we assist any producer who's interested in the transition from conventional chemical-based agriculture over to biological agriculture. So on one of those hot afternoons, as the sun is beating down, I'm with Lalo alongside the river that snakes past this convention center. And I ask him to retell the story that he told on stage at Let's Talk Coffee. A story that shows why the way most of the world grows food the way that I see food being produced when I look outside the train window, that way of growing food could lead to a global crisis. So, a few years ago, Lalo gets a call from a large coffee farmer in Guatemala who is bringing him desperate. It'll make me cry a little bit, but he told me I had lost hope. I was ready to sell my business. I've chose to keep this Guatemala farmer anonymous because, you know, it's not a flattering story. But this farmer is representative of how the majority of coffee is grown. So, he has thousands of trees in neat rows going up and down his mountain slopes. He was managing his coffee farm the conventional way, textbook. He tries to maximize how many coffee cherries his trees produce by giving them a lot of chemical fertilizer. If he sees a fungus developing on one of the leaves, he would spray them all with this chemical fungicide. When he sees an insect, he would cover the plants in chemical insecticides. And for many years, he gets a good harvest and he runs a successful coffee business. But recently, things had been going very, very wrong. To maintain an aesthetically healthy plantation, like a plantation that looks good, looks green, is vigorous, to maintain that standard, he was having to use higher and higher inputs herbicides, fungicides, fertilizers, 
And the increase in inputs was not translating to an increase in productivity anymore. It, it was not only stagnant, but declining. Productivity was declining. This farmer had a serious problem. His harvests were getting smaller and smaller. And in the world of conventional agriculture, when this happened, well, one solution is to give more chemical fertilizer to the plants. But no matter how many little blue pellets he threw on the ground, you know, chemical fertilizer, his harvest kept getting smaller and smaller. And the very strange thing is, on the surface, his plants looked green, vigorous, but they were being ravaged by disease, like Roya, a fungal disease that attacks a coffee plant's leaves. It kills the leaf and stops the plant getting energy from the sun. So in essence, he realized I'm spending a lot of money to keep my plants looking nice, but they're not healthy because they can't resist pathogens. In short, as a business, this farm was dying because the farmer couldn't grow coffee profitably anymore. And this is far from an isolated case. The United Nations has been warning us about this for years. For example, one of the other panelists I talked to at Let's Talk Coffee. I am Tommy. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Protein. He runs an organic composting solution for Ugandan coffee farmers. And Tommy paraphrased what the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization's Deputy Director General said almost 10 years ago. You must have heard that we only have 60 harvests left if we continue the way that we cultivate. Now, that claim, 60 harvests left, It doesn't mean that the soil in any farm near you only has 60 harvests left. The Food and Agricultural Organization was trying to draw attention to the issue of our soils. They estimated that at current rates of soil degradation, 30 football pitchers of fertile soil every minute, there won't be enough fertile soil to feed the world's growing population, estimated to be almost 10 billion by 2050. When I first heard that, I was shocked. My mind raced forward to a world of higher food prices, widespread famines, protests, civil wars, so much suffering because we may not be able to grow enough food anymore. The heart of the problem is that there has been a steady decline in soil quality since the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution was a moment after the Second World War when a very powerful new fertilizer made from nitrogen on this industrial scale was sold to farmers across the world. This fertilizer supercharges global food production. It's one of the reasons that the population of our world has blown up from two and a half billion in the 50s to 8 billion just recently. Industrially produced nitrogen-based fertilizers, you know, they've enabled us humans to more than triple in size in just 70 years, the lifetime of my own parents. But this new method of farming, what is now considered conventional farming, has been terrible for the health of our soils. So this is where conventional agrochemical farming has got us. It enables us to grow tremendously. But if we continue down this path, critics of conventional farming say we are going to regret it. And now, an alternative to conventional agrochemical farming is organic farming. And that's what I'm going to show you in this episode. I'm going to show you how a leading organic coffee farmer cultivates his land here in the mountains of Honduras. Every year, soil quality is deteriorating across many millions of acres of coffee farms across the world. Could one or more of these organic techniques reverse the trend? James Harper, and this is The Science of Coffee, a spin-off series from my documentary coffee podcast, Filter Stories, and a journey into coffee's hidden microscopic secrets.
Okay, organic agriculture. I've come across it so many times before as a consumer. My brother's really into it. You know, beyond the basic philosophy, you know, no chemical fertilizer or pesticides, I didn't really understand what it was doing to the soil. But I had that aha moment when I was at Let's Talk Coffee. Understanding soil biology is really simple. It's not. <laughs> it's just not simple. It's, it's, it's extremely complex and dynamic. I was by the river speaking with Lalo Perez. He told me the story of when he visited that Guatemalan farmer who rang him up desperate. That's when I was like, wow, this is how bad soils can get in a conventional coffee farm using agrochemicals. So here's what happened. Lalo, who's based in Mexico, he traveled south to Guatemala and visited this farmer. Now the issue was, no matter how many blue pellets of chemical fertilizer this farmer threw at his trees, they were producing less and less coffee cherries. Now, when Lalo looked at the trees, they seemed fine, lush, green. But he knew that was only half the story. The other half of the story was underground. It's quite simple to realize what's going on at a farm by looking at the soil if you know what to look for. Lalo wanted to inspect the roots of these coffee trees. So the first thing we did with him was walk around and look at soil. And I asked him here, we have a mission for today. We're going to look for one fungal hyphae. One. What is a fungal hyphae? If you can think of it, it looks like really thin floss, like a filament. Fungal hyphae are organisms, tiny, tiny organisms, that attach themselves to the roots of plants. They connect to other fungal hyphae and they create this network between plants. They're one of the plant world's best friends. They form this symbiotic relationship. For example, they help with nutrient uptake. They help to create a better soil structure. If you went to a forest, they're everywhere. It doesn't matter where you look. They're everywhere. They're absolutely abundant. They're a part of a biologically functioning ecosystem. And when Lalo was walking around the forest that surrounded this coffee farm, he found loads of them. And wherever we looked, there was fungi, <laughs> you know. When he got down on his hands and knees and scraped away at the dirt at the base of these plants in this forest, he would find the white filament strands connected to the roots, the fungal hyphae. The forest was very healthy. It was a well-functioning ecosystem. But when Lalo stepped across the fence and walked just a couple of meters into this coffee farm... And we looked, we searched under the soil, we went everywhere, we didn't find a single, not one, fungal hyphae. We found nothing. The roots of these coffee trees were bare. Not a single white filament strand. And yet, just a few meters over in the forest, every tree root is full of them. And Lalo determined that these coffee trees didn't have fungal hyphae because they were being grown conventionally with a lot of agrochemicals. So the excess of, of chemicals and herbicides and fungicides that kill the fungi were all contributing to decreasing the soil diversity. This is the moment I realized that soil diversity matters. This Guatemalan coffee farmer's trees were producing less and less every year because down in their root system, to put it simply, there just wasn't enough complexity of life, diversity of microorganisms. It was missing out on certain micronutrients. It wasn't able to efficiently digest the blue pellets of chemical fertilizer that were being thrown at it. We'll come back to this farm. But now I want to take you to the coffee farm where I saw for the first time what really good soil diversity looks like. Buenas. Jose de Raos. Listo. Yeah. So, after the Let's Talk Coffee gathering in Copan Ruinas, in, you know, the top left corner of Honduras, I hopped in a jeep with Alison Streaker. She was Sustainable Harvest brand assurance manager at the time. And she very graciously accompanied me for a couple of days, more than anything else, just to help me on what I suspected would be quite technical pieces of Spanish. So we headed south, our jeep snaking up and down the mountains of Honduras. And once we got halfway down the country, not far from the border with El Salvador, 
we pulled into the driveway of one of the leading organic coffee farmers in this region. <laughs> I get out of the car next to this enormous black rotting pile of muck and meet Don Ferofino Dominguez. Mi nombre es Rufino Domínguez. Actualmente soy el presidente de Cooperativa Rao, Marcala La Paz. He's known in the community as Don Rufino. And the day I meet him, he's wearing this heavy blue cotton shirt, ballpoint pen in his breast pocket. And I thought to myself, yeah, he could be maybe early, mid-50s. He didn't have very many gray hairs coming through underneath his baseball cap. Yo nací en 1954. Mm. Turns out, though, He's almost 70. El catación de tus café, cu- cual puntajes. And Don Rufino has reputation in the area for growing very good specialty coffee. Scoring 84, 85, sometimes even up to 87 points. For the non-experts listening, very delicious coffees. I follow Don Rufino as he takes me into his bungalow. I walk past a small TV on the wall. <coughs> And then I find myself in his rustic kitchen. His wife is there, catching up with an old neighbor. Mucho gusto. Hola. ¿Cómo está? And Don Rufino is stood to the side by an old refrigerator. And I get the impression that, you know, he's being polite, just helping the conversation along. But I get a different side of him when we finish the small talk and we step outside into the farm that surrounds his house. That's the moment he springs to life. What's happening down here? He walks me to the ginormous hole he has next to his house where he throws all his organic household waste to compost. I feel like I'm with an excitable teenager. He just jumps right into the pit. He points to a little flower that's pushed its way past rotting banana peels and a moldy mango. And tells me, look, Look, this. Este limón. It's lemon. Oh, sí. limón es este. El limón. He pushes apart the dirt to reveal ah, earthworms and little sí, critters sí, scurrying no. around. Ah, sí, sí, muchas. Sí. Muchas animalitos. Sí. Wow. Entonces, this is living organic material, he tells me. We feed it to the plants and it doesn't have a bad smell at all. Let me smell. Sí, es un tierra rica. Don Rufino scoops some of this rotting dirt and we stare at it. It's dense, thick, dark, humid, writhing in life. Tienen vida, tienen vida. Ellas viven allí. Sí, sí, sí. Bueno, bueno. Okay. Now I know what an alive soil looks like. And I can imagine that this is the type of soil that a coffee plant would love to sink its roots into. Because this is the soil you would find in a natural forest. But then I remember that this isn't a natural forest. This is a commercial coffee farm. And the thing about coffee farms is that they are extractive, right? Every year, the coffee plants take in all these nutrients and moisture, and they put so much energy into creating these sweet, juicy coffee cherries. Now, in a forest, these cherries would be eaten by other animals that fall on the forest floor, and they would be recycled, nourish the soil again, and all the living things in it. But on a coffee farm, we pick off these coffee cherries and take them away. All that sugar, energy, nutrients, it's removed from the ecosystem. And if we don't put nutrients back in, the soils run out. And eventually, the coffee plants won't have enough nutrients to produce coffee cherries anymore. You know, thinking back to my conversation with Lalo by the river at Let's Talk Coffee, he explained how that Guatemalan farmer producing coffee conventionally fixed that problem of soil depletion. He would add nutrients back into the soil by throwing blue pellets of fertilizer, which contained the three major nutrients that plants need, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. We're trying to supplement that with imported energy in the form of chemical fertilizer. But it's not enough. Plants need a whole swathe of micronutrients, plus a diverse biology in and around their root systems to thrive and resist diseases. Looking around me on Don Rufino's farm, you know, 
in this home compost pit. I think to myself, this pile of rotting banana skins and moldy mangoes, he surely doesn't have enough nutrients to replenish the hundreds and hundreds of coffee trees he has on this farm. It's, what, what's happening down here? Este es del año pasado. But Don Rufino walks me down to where we park the cars at the bottom of the driveway. And we stand in front of that enormous pile of rotting muck. I mean, it is an enormous pile of rotting muck. But it's also his very carefully controlled organic fertilizer. This mound of rotting mess, it's almost as big as a car. And it sits under a metal corrugated roof on stilts. And on one of the beams, I spot this small picture of a blonde-colored dog. That's Don Rufino's dearly departed dog, Boxer. And he named his farm after him. Don Rufino explains to me what is in this compost. The bulk of it is actually coffee fruit. When you pick a coffee cherry off a tree, you just want the hard green bean inside it. And farmers actually take off the soft, gooey cherry flesh, the fruit flesh, they take it off. So he adds all of that into a big pile, and then he adds ash, Ceniza, chicken dung, and sand with a very high phosphorus content, plus all the scraps from that compost heap next to his house. Now, here's the thing. This is a commercial coffee farm, and the coffee trees need access to those nutrients quickly so they can keep producing coffee cherries year on year. And as we know, when we like throw an orange peel on the ground, it takes weeks and weeks to break down. This enormous pile of rotting coffee pulp and chicken dung and sand, if Don Rufino were to throw that onto his plants as is, it would take a long time to break down and for all those nutrients to sink down into the soil. Don Rufino has to speed up the process. And he does it with these two ingredients, which felt to me like the magic ingredients in a witch's potion. The first of these magic ingredients is mountain microorganisms. I had no idea what Don Rufino was talking about. So he took a few steps back, looked on the ground, and then picked up a stick. It was a piece of old wood broken off from a tree that had been lying around for a while. And in and amongst the dark brown bark were these interconnected patches of this flaky white material. This is mold, fungi, mountain microorganisms. I actually have a video of Don Rufino showing me this on my Instagram, at Filter Stories Podcast. I'll put a link in the show notes. Don Rufino says he walks into the nearby forest and picks up 20, 30 pounds of this white fungus. Turns out, decomposing leaves are some of the best sources for this. And he mixes it into that giant heap of rotting coffee pulp. Don Rufino's plants love mountain microorganisms. Lots of fungi are a key piece to a healthy soil ecosystem. And here's the thing about fungus. Plants love some types of fungus, and they don't like other types of fungus. It's all about having the right type of fungi in the soil to create an ecosystem when, you know, when it works together as it should, it helps bring oxygen into the soil, it makes nutrients available for the plant, it helps the plants fix nitrogen down into the soil, and it also helps the plants resist diseases. So Don Rufino throws these wild mountain microorganisms into his coffee pulp pile, and he wants them to spread throughout the pile. But that's going to take a long time. He's got to speed up the process. Which leads me to the second magic ingredient. In front of us is a large plastic round tub. Don Rufino takes the lid off. He grabs a cut-up plastic container, scoops it down, and pulls out this dripping, thick, rich goo. Wow. That's brutal. That's like, that's like a super sweet. This is molasses. It's similar to a dark honey. It's used in cakes, cocktails sometimes. But for Don Rufino, this is 
sugar, energy for the fungi, the mountain microorganisms. Don Rufino explains, the mountain microorganisms eat up all the sugar, the fungus multiplies like crazy. The mountain microorganisms then spread throughout this compost heap, which is why I see these big white streaks running through the black moldy pile. This pile is now decomposing so quickly that when Alison Streaker and I would get close to the pile and put our hands near it, it's scorching hot. Wow, it's yeah, like it's actually so burning hot. hot. It's, it's burning, burning hot. <laughs> so this decomposing pile of organic matter writhing with life, this is what Don Durofino shovels onto the base of each of his coffee trees. This is how his coffee trees on this organic farm get new nutrients. Now, replenishing the soil with new nutrients, that is just one piece of the farming jigsaw puzzle. What about pests and diseases? So thinking back to that conventional coffee farm in Guatemala that Lala was telling me about, there, the trees needed to be sprayed with fungicides and insecticides because pests and diseases would come along all the time and the plants were getting crippled by them. They couldn't fight them off. Now, Don Rufino definitely does use some bug spray. He opens one of his sheds to show me what it looks like. And you know, it's not this industrially produced chemical that kills insects. It's more of a homemade organic bug repellent. There is a huge difference between what Don Rovino is doing compared to conventional coffee farms. For example, the ingredients in a chemical pesticide you might find on a conventional coffee farm typically include organophosphates, which are derived from phosphoric acid, pyrophroids, a synthetic chemical, and carbamates from carbamic acid. And all these chemicals are manufactured industrially. Now, when I visit the Rouse Cooperative, the organic cooperative that Don Rufino is a part of, I found the manual for how they make their homemade organic bug repellent. You ready for this? <laughs> so here it is. Mash a pound of garlic, onions, ginger, chili, and bay leaves all together in a bucket. Then pour a gallon of vinegar, molasses, sugar cane juice, and water, which has some mountain microorganisms floating around in it. You mix it all together, let it sit for 15 days, and voila, you can spray it on your plants. I mean, it sounds absolutely putrid. And I guess putrid enough for even insects that love putrid stuff to be like, all right, all right, all right, that's enough, that's enough, too much for me. I'm going to go over to this other plant over here instead. But this is the point. On Don Rufino's farm, he doesn't need to spray hardcore pesticides on his plants. He just needs this somewhat mild repellent. Because fundamentally, his trees are stronger, healthier, more resilient compared to trees on a conventional coffee farm. And they just don't need as much help to fight off pests and diseases. And when I was speaking with Lalo back at Let's Talk Coffee, one thing I found really fascinating is that you can't always tell how healthy a plant is just you know, by looking at it. And unfortunately, aesthetic appearances or appearances are deceiving. And it's especially true with health in biology. Lalo gave me the example of us, a human. Say you, you look at a human and that person looks completely healthy to you. They, they have all the parameters of, of health, but really they have a chronic disease inside of them. On a conventional coffee farm using agrochemicals, yes, the trees can look really green, lush, but that is deceptive. Because without the biology, the fungi in and around their roots and other microorganisms like nitrogen-fixing bacteria, protozoa, functional nematodes, without this beneficial biology in the soil around their roots, they spend way too much energy, scarce, scarce energy, trying to build an ecosystem around their roots, and they don't have enough energy left over to build an immune system. When I learned about this, it was really 
game changing for me. I understood much better how to think about plants. And I want to share these learnings with you, just not in audio, because it's kind of too technical. So what I'm going to do instead is create an infographic on Instagram. I'll put a link in the show notes. Come check it out. So back at Don Rufino's farm, he knows that healthy trees have a very vibrant ecosystem in and around their roots. This is the protection mechanism against pests and diseases. He can't use chemical sprays, so he has to rely on the plants being as healthy as possible. And to help nurture that complexity in and around the soil, he shows me how he plants a mind-boggling number of shade trees. Going up the mountain slope from his house, he and I are stood in a field of coffee trees, and I look around and I see so many different types of tree, and I ask him, what are they? And that was a mistake, because he spends the next five minutes listing them all. <laughs> so he's got mango, eh, mango pepper, pimienta, not one, but two species of avocado, one of which is colored purple, morado, bananas, guineo, guineo, limes, limas, pineapple oranges, una naranja piña, another kind of orange. Naranja nebula. You know, he has so many fruit trees, he says he never has to go to town to buy any fruit. And sometimes he doesn't even have to buy medicine. He grows medicinal plants, like the hypericum, which, when you cut it, releases an acid which can cure infections and itches. And he mentions so many types of trees I have never heard of. After staring up at all these shade trees, Don Rufino's gaze comes back down and he points to all the coffee trees around us. And he shows me how much attention he pays to each and every tree. For example, he prunes these trees very often to keep them healthy. He removes the weaker branches so the tree can focus its limited energy on growing the strong branches. And sometimes he decides, you know what, this entire tree I want it to start all over again. Oh God, it's happening, it's happening. We're cutting the coffee tree. In vivo, this is it. This is, this is live radio. Thunder of Vino cuts a tree at this stump. Oh my goodness. I feel, I feel guilty for the death of this tree. It's not the death of the tree. Wow, up it goes. That's mucha. Yo lo que espero que este me dé... Don Rufino explains that this tree, you know, it produced so many coffee cherries this year that the next harvest is going to be kind of low. By cutting it down, it will regrow again stronger. I'm going to try a bean. Let me try a bean here. The time has come to say goodbye to Don Rufino. And I do what I always do when I visit a coffee farm. I taste coffee cherry. Mm. This was muy, muy dulce. And it's delicious. Wow, that was bursting with flavor. That, that's a really tasty coffee. And as we hop back in the Jeep and drive down to the local town, Marcala. Unos, dos, tres. Perfecto. I think to myself, this is an amazing way to grow coffee. The soil, it's alive, so fertile. The trees seem healthier, stronger. The birds are happier. The environment is happier. Don Rufino, he's a happy guy. He loves this stuff. There are fewer landslides, less agricultural runoff into rivers because the soil structure is stronger. Why isn't all coffee grown this way? And I think the reason we don't see more organic coffee farms is because it's really hard. Much harder than doing it the conventional way. And in the next episode, I'm going to show you the story of Don Rufino's cooperative, Araus. They are a success story today, but the farmers who chose to go organic, they had to overcome so many hurdles. And I'm going to show you what those hurdles look like to answer the question, why is it so hard switching from conventional agriculture over to organic?
So, thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, please share it with your friends. I'm just a one-man band here making these podcasts. You know, I really rely on people like you to enjoy it and spread the word about it. So yeah, thank you for telling your friends about it. Here are some ideas. You can take a screen grab of you listening to this episode on your podcast player, post it as a story on Instagram, tag me at Filter Stories Podcast, and I'll reply and say thank you. You could give it a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and also five stars on Spotify because Spotify has ratings too now, I guess. And if you're interested in knowing what it was like to create these episodes behind the scenes, I have a newsletter on Substack. Link in the show notes. Come check it out and yeah, learn about why that episode about smell and taste it drove me crazy. It was so hard to make. Coming up next in the second series of The Science of Coffee. On the next episode, come with me as I get schooled, badly schooled in basic scientific methodology. I go on a journey where I realize what it takes to think like a scientist and how that can help me make better brews at home. And this journey was made possible by BWT Water & More. They make water filtration kits for coffee brewing at home, in the cafe, and me learning the science of water, which is really complicated, actually helped transform me from a naive coffee professional to a little bit less naive, much more earnest home coffee scientist. After that, we delve into the science of coffee aging and grinding so you can get the most flavors out of your beans. And I spent a couple of days inside the R&D lab of Mal Koenig, an industry leader in coffee grinders trusted by baristas globally. And I discover how grinders work and why it is tiny, tiny changes can lead to dramatically different coffees. And in case you missed it, in the first episodes, I show you how you can become a better coffee taster by unpacking how our sense of taste and smell works. I also get metaphysical and I ask, do you and me experience the same thing when we drink the same coffee? I put that question to the test by using Marco Beverage Systems SP9. I make many batches of the exact same coffee and I am astounded when I get wildly different responses. And the episodes before this one, I take you through the science of roasting and how flavors are created when we turn a green bean brown. I hop on a flight to Norway to visit Roost a company developing a fully automatic coffee roaster. They open up their roasters for me and I'm amazed at the technology in them that basically enables anyone, even me, to roast exceptional coffee easily. The Science of Coffee is produced by me, James Harper, and I also write and play the piano music. And I want to give a special thanks to all the people who helped me in Marcala. Rojo Danilo Moreno, Perfecto Dominguez, Elvin Jesus Ruiz, Osman Contreras, the team at Rouse, and the brilliant team at Sustainable Harvest. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll speak to you next time.